Hey, what's up, guys? Big announcement. You can get the fully uncensored versions of these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you listen to podcasts. So go over there right now if you want to hear this fully uncensored. Download, subscribe, leave us a comment. Now let's get into this episode. Today, our guest is Richard Villa, hilarious stand up comedian here in LA. He's from Compton, California originally, and he's here to tell us about his insane childhood. At the time, I knew it was not okay because they told us, don't say anything at a th as a three year old. This guy ran a crack house with his father when he was eight years old. You heard that right. From eight to 13, he ran a dope spot in Compton with his family, including his mother and his five brothers. My mom would cook it. My uncle would let everybody in the hood know where we were at, and then my dad oversees the whole thing. Wild, insane stories that could only come out of a place like Los Angeles. In Compton, now there's a crackhead with a goat. And so now they're negotiating, and I'm like, Dad, I don't want a goat. Callate, the goat is pregnant. We're going to get a deal. He tells us about going to school, kindergarten, with wads of cash in his pocket. They said, hey, we caught your kid with 300 bucks. My dad thought I was snitching. My dad thought they got us. He eventually grew up, got out of that life, started doing stand-up comedy, and blew up. Even he's telling the man go. Like, we can start again, but I'll make you another one. Let's go. I didn't even really like it. He also talks about getting canceled by the entire country of Mexico. You can hear that on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash The Connect Show. I talked to Tom Segura about it. He was upset at the comic that banned me and started blacklisting. This guy has an incredible story of crime to redemption. Uh, now he's just one of the best stand-up comedians working. This was one of my favorite episodes, truly. You guys are watching The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. Let's get into it. As a nine-year-old, as an eight-year-old, the things I heard from grown men, grown women, it makes you lose respect for humanity in, it, in itself. You go, these are my peers. These are the people I'm supposed to respect. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. And then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, a shank, it's like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. All right, Orale S.A., Richard what's Villa, up, what's baby? up, man? <laughs> you are the first comedian we've had on this podcast. Are you kidding after me? After almost a year, no. Wow, just criminals and thugs and right. the garbage right. of the earth. And you said, let's exactly. bring a comic. Just, just Thank you for trashing <laughs> everybody that's been on this show before. I'm joking. <laughs> Listen, I've seen the show. <laughs> that's yeah. what, I'm, part, I'm here because I'm part of that. <laughs> no, no, no. We agree with you. We actually, we, we some of these people we've had on the show have been dubious, to yes. say the least. Uh, but I like it because we share at least some kind of similarity. Our backgrounds before getting into stand-up yeah. were, you know, outside of the law. So I'm happy you hit me up. Yeah. and asked to come on here man yeah I, I i i saw the podcast i saw what you guys were talking about i said nobody's ever as a comedian nobody's ever gonna ask me about my past mm -hmm. like not necessarily hey what's up with the you know you selling crack in yeah. compton with your dad yeah like, yeah well do you <laughs> talk about it i started talking about it now but i i did have to talk to my family i spoke to my mom i talk, spoke to my brothers i said look we share the same father and these stories are going to be about him and how we grew up with him mm -hmm. selling crack mm -hmm. and all the sh we did as kids. Right. And yeah. so they were like, dude, he's dead. Everybody you're going to talk to about is dead. Yeah. Yeah. Knock yourself out. Now, do you do jokes about it on stage? I joke about all of this. It's called a, a full hour called Crack at 10. It's my life story from 10 to 13. Wow. That's on crack at 10. I love yeah, that. Crack dude. At 10. That's I, when I really dove in. When everything got started, I was eight, but I, I start the stories at 10. Right. So where are you from originally? Compton, California, born in Martin Luther King Hospital. Okay. But Down the street, just a few, totally. half an hour from here. Okay. So you're born in Compton. And as I told you over the phone, I had no idea Mexicans lived in Compton before recently. Are you kidding me, bro? I'm not kidding you. We I'm, were part of, after right after the riots and the Watts, we came over. Somebody had to clean, clean that up. You got to understand, every time there's a tragedy in America, Latinos come and fix it up. I made do a joke understand? about that. I, I do a joke about yes. that, about how if we get into nuclear war with Russia, Mexicans are about it. to become billionaires yes. from those cleaning contracts. Yes. Those yes. hauling contracts are going to be insane. You had LA uh, Watts riots. Uh, what are, you, are we talking the 60? Two riots? Yeah, yes. That's, that's when they came over. Well, who's going to 
Ring up and fix all that shit. Of course. And, and then start you, a business yeah, out of Watts nothing. Watts is right next door to Compton. Right, so right. So Watts, Compton became very predominantly black and Latino. Especially in the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. you started seeing it blossom more. You had a lot of Latinos coming, right. coming in. But so you were born in Compton, but did you go back to Mexico? I went like, back to Mexico. Where's the, where's the accent coming from? I went back to Mexico. My dad, at the age of three, my dad decides, you know what? I've made enough money at that time. I was three or four. My dad was smuggling illegals. So, okay. okay so a little backstory. Yeah, right? sure. So we're, I'm born in, in Compton. And at, so the farthest I can remember is three. And we lived in Watts. Mm-hmm. Are you and from the projects? In or? the projects. No, not the projects. The, the house in okay, Watts, in gotcha. the city of Watts. We were like literally a block away from the projects. Okay. But it was a big house. Those big majestic houses. Of one in the front was a huge one. Then had two other servant houses in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These huge lots. And so we lived in the front house. And my jo dad's job was the holding house. So when you get smuggled, you pay half up front. Right. Then you get smuggled. And then there's a holding house mm -hmm. where we hold all the illegals. Okay. As soon as they get across the border, they go they straight there. They go to my there. dad's house. Right. And then my mom will feed them in the morning. Okay. Wow. And little by little, everybody starts calling their relatives, come pick up your relative, but yeah. bring the money, bring the money, bring the money, bring the money, bring the money. Right. That's how we distribute all the illegals. So right. the, the next half, my dad will pick up the second half. Right. Once okay. they're on the other side. So they would do this maybe twice a week. We're little kids. Me and my <laughs> older brother, he's a year older. He's four or five. Um, we're just little kids. And kid, little kids wake up in the morning. My dad used to then store them in our room, the kids' room. He, he put like 30 illegals, 40 illegals in <laughs> one room. Why? Because fuck it. That's the only thing that had a latch where he can lock it from the outside. So two days a week, you would have 30, I would, 30 dirty, dirty, whatever, whatever came desperate through. Desperate migrants. Yes. Staying in your, yes. your bedroom. And then my mom would cook in the morning for everybody. What would you make? We need con huevo, eggs, yeah. and just whatever just breakfast. Just a big pot of eggs. Uh, and, a big and pot of eggs. Rice Everybody and tortillas, got beans, right? all that stuff. Yeah. Sometimes soup, whatever mm -hmm. was in the menu, right? But we were kids. We were we were meeting all these people every freaking day. The reason my dad had to skip town and we went back to Mexico, one, he had put away a lot of money. Second, my older brother gets enticed by one of the illegals inside our room. This is Saturday morning. Mm. And so we get up at six in the morning. We want to see cartoons and we're little kids. And the guy inside our, our room, our room, the kids room, say, like, hey, you guys want your toys? You guys want to play? Yeah, yeah, we want to play. Oh. Open the door. See, one of the illegals had saw how my dad had locked it. It's just a latch. Yeah. A little hook. That's it. They can't get out. So he knew that it was just a little latch. So he convinced my older brother, hey, take off the latch. Yeah. So how, so he starts coaching him and all of a sudden he coaches my brother to open the latch. Keep in mind, they haven't paid the other half. Right. Once he opens the latch, they all start running they out. Bolt, right. They bolt, right. bolt and my oh, brother's okay. like, eh. Hey. So my dad wakes up like half an hour later, right. an hour later goes, who opened the door? And we're inside playing with the toys. And so all the migrants yeah. are gone. Yes. They and we're telling split. my dad, they all left. They wow. all left. We were going to play. They all left. Well, first of all, thank God. I thought that story was going towards something naughty. Okay? No, it wasn't. I that was, uh, he was enticing your brother for, you know, a or something like that. You know what? It, it, that would have been better yeah. for my dad to deal with that shit oh, than yeah, to your deal dad, with your dad happily 18 people missing that now the other side of this is going, no, 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 no. Lolo, did you take the money? Or did your son really open that Right, door? because now the cartel in Mexico that got the guys across is like, you, you no, owe No, no, you owe me the other half. Right. Where's the other half? How do I know you didn't call them? Right. Now, now, how can, let me ask you this. I don't know if you know this. How much were, how much was did it cost for a coyote back in the day? Right now, I've heard it's as high as like $17,000. Yes. Like it's it's as high as it's ever been to get across the border. How much yeah. was it back in like the early 90s? You know what? It, early 90s, 500. Wow. 800. So crazy. It wasn't as strict. I still remember early 90s, us smuggling my Uncle Hugo. Mm -hmm. We went to Tecate, which is an easier border to cross, by the way. Why? It, just because it has so much open fields and ranches in Tecate, uh -huh. it's not as populated as right. the other cities like right. Mexicali or Tijuana. So Tecate, there was a site where there was just literally a barbed wire fence dividing both countries. And all, it was like a two-mile walk 
through, yeah. through those hills. Yeah. And then you just come to a small little town and you, we would pick up my dad. I remember it was uh, my uncle, it was snowing when we crossed him through Tecate. Mm -hmm. And our job was just like, just wait over here. He'll come through. Just leave the, the car on with the lights on. And sure enough, here comes my uncle. <laughs> he says, yep, it was about two two miles, but here we are. And it, did, it was easy to cross. Yeah, it was, it was easy. easy to cross. That's why the price bucks. was so much lower, too. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't that it, you just pre 9 11. It. Right, of course. Of now, course. when 9 11 hit, everything, everything changed. changed. And it's a boom. The cartels love it because that makes oh, yeah. their price skyrocket. Yeah. That's the like they're making so much money now. I've heard that they are putting out, and this is according to like the mainstream media. So who knows if it's true, right? But the cartels, according to like MSNBC, are putting out advertisements all over the world, Africa, the Middle East, right? Not Ooh. even like places in Central America that it's like, come to Mexico. It's a free for all at the border right now. If you got the money, we will get you in like guaranteed. Yeah. But now they're doing these caravans of people. Yeah. So now they, they're literally organizers. They'll go, hey, they'll go to... Venezuela. Okay, mm -hmm. guys, gather up. I'm your escort to the border. Right. <laughs> you know, we'll charge you this much. Mm -hmm. It's bullshit. You're just walking with us and you just right. charge exactly. all, these, all this amount. Yeah. Why do we need you? Yeah. But they, you need them because they'll extort they'll you. Yeah. They'll take you on the on the, those roads going through Mexico. They'll yeah. take all your We ended up leaving back to Mexico when I was like four or five. So because of that. Because that, to... that, so my dad stopped working with them. You know, there's bad blood now. Who was them, by the way? I don't know who they were. I, I, my Where's dad your dad from? Where's your family Mexicali, from? the border okay. town. Okay, so they're from, they're border people. Yeah, Got they're it. border people. So so he knew people that were working the border. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, like, they like probably went to high school with him. At this time, I'm just a kid. Yeah. So it's not like they tell me anything. Yeah. I'm just living this life where it's, at the time, I knew it was not okay because they told us, don't say anything at a th as a three-year-old. You know what I mean? <laughs> so mijo, you knew, mijo, no, no diga nada. Nada. Hey, callado, mijo. <laughs> callado. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but we knew it was bad. So we go back to Mexico. My dad opens up a Conasupo, a supermarket in mm -hmm. La Puerta. That's where he's from. And everything's going well. But my dad's the kind of person that burns the candle from both ends. Mm -hmm. So he's still coming to the U.S. He's still doing shady shit. He's still selling paperwork he's he he gets his hands on everything if there was like somewhere to make money my dad found a way to fucking yeah. get his hand mm -hmm. in it good or bad you know legal or illegal he yeah. was all about it so but he also liked women he also liked drinking he also liked doing drugs he also liked partying oh so. geez what a shock oh wow a mexican right? guy wow could be into those things <laughs> a mexican man with some disposable income so he basically has a huge car accident wrecks it, almost dies, burns like, I don't know, 60% of his body, scar tissue everywhere. Oh, no. The guy gets slammed into the, literally the, like the, the car flipped over. They were running away from the cops. This car flipped over and just goes into embankment oh, into the God. river. It, luckily, he that was on hit this the side canal. Or? No, in Mexico. Okay. Because at this time he had the supermarket. Remember, he made money on the in the U.S. The people that Trump were was talking about, that's my dad. Like every, the, is a drug dealer, the criminal. That was my dad. Right, right, like right. I was like, I can't say no. So, so Trump true. was being accurate. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was being somewhat accurate. Yeah. That was all my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as an American, I don't want him here. <laughs> Sheesh. Dad, yeah. can you f this country more? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so he then loses in Mexico. There was a big dive in the economy in, in the 80s. Right. El peso se devoló. Mm -hmm. So now... My dad has to sell the, the the supermarket, and we come back to the U.S. Right. I'm eight at the time. We end up like in Compton, California. So, and this is what year now? This is around eighty seven, eighty eight, right. eighty six, roughly around that eight. I was eight or nine mm -hmm. years old. So crack just is popping. Crack just had started cracking. Yeah. So, so my dad was like, look, my dad was never going to be the nine to five guy. Like my dad mm. came back to the U.S. going, okay, what's the next hustle? <laughs> so his cousin Ricky, basically, he's a, a biker gang, comes and tells him, "Hey, right now we need you to have a, we need a house in Compton. Mm. Like we need you to sell." And my dad was like, "I don't know, Ricky. Like, don't you have something where I can just go and deliver? I want to be the drop-off guy. I want to just, I don't want to be the guy in the corner." He says, "No, no, I'm telling you, have a house. Like it's a stash house. We keep." 
there. Like, I need a house in Compton, but you could also sell. So, you know, you don't have to pay rent. That, that pays the rent, all that. What's up, you guys? Let's take a minute to thank our longtime sponsor of the show, Mood. You guys, this is the number one CBD and Delta 8, Delta 9 products company in the country, completely legal and delivered discreetly to your doorstep. You guys, go over to hellomood.co to get a wide variety of everything from gummies, edibles, pre-rolls, flour. You guys, I use CBD every day. It helps with my joint pain, it helps me sleep, it helps with anxiety, as well as the Delta 8 and Delta 9 products. Hello Mood is the last company you will need to use when it comes to these products, you guys. They are offering an amazing discount right now. You know what to do. Go over to hellomood.co and use that promo code CONNECT20 to get 20% off anything on their website. And that is a whole lot to choose from. And of course, they're offering an amazing giveaway. If you guys use the promo code CONNECT FREE, you're going to get a five count pack of gummies delivered completely free. And all you do is pay for shipping. You guys, go to hellomood.co right now and support them because they support our great show. Thank you so much. Let's get back into the episode. Had your dad ever sold dope before? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, strange. He was just not trying to be a corner guy. Like, he didn't want to come back to the U.S. and, all right, hit a corner. Here's half a gram. Go sell it. Mm. He, wanted, he wanted to be more than that. So, well, did he ever import? Did he ever, uh, you know, with his connections in Mexico? He, he never imported because what he wanted to do was just keep it low key. Like mm -hmm. he said, I want to make enough or move a big amount but I don't want to move grams. But also my dad wasn't a, a what do you going to say this? That will cheat you. So people didn't trust them. Yeah. Do you understand okay. that motherfucker was shady too? So it's not like a lot of people said, oh, Lolo, let's trust that tequila. He's yeah. solid. That, that wasn't the case. It was always trying to hustle something. Yeah. So he sounds like he wasn't a great business No, man. horrible. No, I'm going to get into the, the mm -hmm. drug dealing part of this. Mm -hmm. He was a horrible drug dealer. Okay, cluckers would come. You know what a clucker, clucker is, Clucker right? is a crackhead. Yeah, yeah. Crackhead. We would come to the house, and we were the translators because my dad didn't speak any English. Mm -hmm. So we they would come in, and we start negotiating at 3 in the morning, 2 in the morning. Every time we heard a knock on the door, we knew we wow. were selling crack. So we would get up, and we were negotiating. My dad would always get tools and surfboard, a piano. Once he negotiated for a bus, I'm like, dad, you're supposed to get money, not fucking shit. <laughs> right. This is not Pawn Stars. Yeah. Like, you don't get to just look at the item and yeah. negotiate how much you're going to give him in crack. <laughs> like, dude, I'm serious. We got a goat one night. And this is this is where it just becomes comedy automatically. <laughs> Stop it. No, bro. This a is, crackhead I, came with a goat? To, uh, to, <laughs> yes. In the, it's fucking two, three in the morning and we're standing there and, and we had asked my dad for a pet. We wanted a dog. <laughs> Said that you wanted a pet. I said, I, he said, when I was a kid, I raised Chivas in Mexicali. So he was a goat road, uh, handler or yeah, whatever. Like he, a goat herder. Yeah. Goat I didn't know herder. you guys had goats. Not me. I my dad was as a kid. Cows. But at, at in Compton, now there's a crackhead with a goat. <laughs> and so now they're negotiating and I'm like, dad, I don't want a goat. Like, the goat is pregnant. We're going to get a deal. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding We're me? We're going to get a two for like, one. Yes. Be quiet. Like, this is going to be a good deal. So he got us goats because he said, look, it's good. Their milk is good. It's good to, to give you enough nutrients, all this. Shit. I was like, dude, we're not going to eat this. Shit. Like, so here are, we create a makeshift, uh, like corral in Compton for our goats. And months, like a month <laughs> later, the goat gave birth. And so now we have three goats. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is a crazy. This shit. is the most ghetto shit. This doesn't, I've never heard. this is the, the joke itself. I say it on stage, but this is how it happened, bro. The goats get out of the corral. Okay. We're inside. We're watching TV, minding our own business. We get a phone call at the house because there's no cell phones back then. Early nineties, late eighties. We just get a phone call. Hello. Hey, your goats are out here in El Calimex. You guys got to come get them. They were eating the stuff out here in the Calimex. What? Your goats. My neighbor was calling us that he saw our goats in like in El Calimex. They had what is jumped. Calimex? Calimex is a supermarket. <laughs> These fucking goats went and straight to a supermarket. Now they're inside the supermarket eating the shit inside the supermarket. <laughs> so we're rushing in over their, there. Hey, very Compton. They're in their shoplifting. Dude, literally, if you go to uh, uh, Little Rosecrans in Alameda, there used to be a Calimex before the LA riots. If people know that area in Compton, don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> It's right across the street from a church. And the goats ended up in that supermarket. So we showed up, picked them up. 
take them back to the house and um the uh the cops show up you understand yeah sure a goat in a supermarket of course the cops are going to show of up. Of course, they're like, oh, the, the guy in the supermarket, the owner, the man, everybody's calling the cops. Right. So cops show up and we're selling crack. Mm -hmm. Now, hang on for a second. It's Tell me about that. So who convinced, so these biker gangs basically convinced your dad. His cousin was work. part of the biker gang. And, and who's the biker gang? Uh, do I have to say? Yeah. Of course you do. have to say? Mm-hmm. Oh shoot! You want to go to jail? Or you want to go home? You got You got to snitch. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say they were they were the the rivals to the angels. Oh, the Mongols. Got it. Okay, oh, I didn't say it. You didn't say it. No, no, no. But we assume it's the Mongols yes. because I was just putting those are a lot of Latinos are part of that uh, okay. part of that gang. Okay, so perfect. but this is all speculation. Okay, so at that moment, the the early, later eighties, early nineties. Yeah. They were booming. They were moving. They were doing all sorts of stuff. Gotcha. And they're active in the Southland, like the South yes, part of LA. They were active in the gotcha. Southland. My dad was really just my his cousin was just really just trying to help him out, get him a house. Yeah. He saw he had four kids, man. You understand? <laughs> Workers. Workers. Put him to no, work. Put him to work. <laughs> he said, "Well, I don't know the neighborhood here because my dad was coming in. It, my dad was really paisa, really Mexican. He wouldn't de deal with any blacks. He was very bigot and yeah. racist. Yeah, which is how Mexicans were in LA yes, back very, in the day. It was very. Yeah. It, and my and I told my dad, "Why are you so racist and bigot?" He says, "You understand? The late seventies, early eighties, we would go to the store to get our checks cash, and black guys would be waiting for us to beat the." out of us and take our checks right now you're trying to tell me that i should respect and honor or or or, or not or trust these people no mm -hmm. for years they beat the out of mm -hmm. me and all of my colleagues right they took our checks yeah. I, I it's like the border patrol agent there's a big stigma because when illegals cross the border you beat them yeah of course there's yeah. gonna be a stigma right. so right he, so he had that old school men mentality racist still. mentality yeah. but he also understood that that's his biggest market yeah they're smoking crack. They're smoking crack <laughs> in Compton at that time. So, so they're doing with those checks. So my uncle was a crackhead. My uncle was a crackhead. Who was part of the No, 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 gang no. This is a different a, guy. This, this is, is his a brother. This, Got it. This is an, an, a cousin, my dad's cousin from another, from his mom's sister. Okay. So that was his cousin who was supplying him. His brother, uh, Ugo, he was a crackhead. Yeah. He was our marketing department. The guy you smuggled. Huh? The guy you smuggled. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 oh, great. The, the, You're bringing over our uh, best uh, and are, brightest. Uh, you have to. Are you kidding me? You have to. So you bring my uncle Ugo. He smokes crack. So he knows. So he's the, the marketing department. He's the he marketing knows all department. the crackheads. Totally. My mom would cook it up. She was a great cook. How did your mom, your sweet mother, who used to cook, uh, you know, your favorite uh, mm. uh, salsa con, or what do you, yeah, I don't know, some Mexican away, dish. Or whatever. Yeah. How did she learn how to cook? Uh, my, my dad's cousin, which we call uncle. Mm-hmm. Showed him how to cook. Showed right. my mom how to cook. This is how you cook it. Wow. They're going to rock it up. Uh, this is how, cover your mouth. This is the vapes. When it gets hard enough, just take it out, let it cool down, cut it. Wow. This is how you package it. And then they would bring us the scales. They would set it all up. And they would say, okay, I knew the metric system as a kid. Dude. Wow. And did she have the Pyrex? The Pyrex I, pot? She had everything set up. I don't know what it was as a kid, but she had a mason jar in, inside. Yeah. And that's how she would just... Mix, so you would mix, you would mix. watch her? Of course, I would. Oh we God. wouldn't be trusted with that much product, bro. Like for us, it was put it in the vial, mm -hmm. vials, yeah. Uh, package it, sell it in the window. That was us. Like when it came to like big boy talk, the kids were not allowed. But you would actually watch your mother. Oh, you could watch all that's of this insane. Stuff. You that's insane. That's at eight years stuff. old. At eight years old. Wow. <clears throat> and and then they would tell you, okay, this is worth ten dollars. This is worth twenty. Yes. And there was a box, and everything was separated, and everything was counted. And there was something my dad taught: don't ever steal. Yeah. You could be gay. You could be a drug addict. He let I don't me be gay. He would let me that's, be gay. That that's is progressive. very progressive for, for a Mexican those, guy yes. back then. That's yes. very progressive. So he says, don't ever steal from me. <laughs> don't ever steal about his money. Says, but it's I'm weird though be because he was. He was kind of a shady guy telling he, you not to be shady. Dude, he told us never steal, never steal. I said, Dad, do you know that everything we take in that night with Clucker yeah, is stolen, right? Stolen. You know, yeah, so we course. can take stolen shit. That goat was probably stolen. Yes, it oh. definitely was stolen. <laughs> I'm looking for a stolen goat. <laughs> yeah. She's pregnant. <laughs> no, to finish that story, the cops showed up and my dad told them, oh, no, no, the excuse of we're going to make a party. This is birria. Oh. We're going to make birria with the goat. <laughs> 
We're going to eat it. <laughs> and the cop's like, no, no, sir, this is livestock. <laughs> you understand? You don't get to, this, this is not food. This is alive. And my dad was like, oh, it's alive? Okay. He takes out his knife and he kills the goat in front of him. He goes, food? And the cop goes, food. Food, let's go partner food. That's it. We're like, what the f This is on a Wednesday, bro. We ate birria on a Wednesday. My dad, he didn't want to deal with the cops coming into the house. Yeah, let's go yeah. check the Because if they go back there, they're going to see the corral. Obviously, this is not food, bro. You wow. didn't buy them to buy it. Wow. So but the cops didn't answer. They were, that was good enough for them. Well, I mean, what report? What are they, what are they taking in? And the guy said it was food. Okay. We got away. There's nothing. There's not a crime there. No. People can buy livestock, kill it, and then eat it. And if he decides to eat it on a Wednesday, that's his business. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so the cops really didn't do anything. They just left. And but it was he, just crazy. The story, like, what the as fuck? As you guys made video from that. Of course, we wow. were going to have to take advantage of the fact that we just killed the cult. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you guys dodged a bullet there. So, the, so, so my mom would cook it. My uncle would let everybody in the hood know where we're at. Mm -hmm. And then my dad oversees the whole thing. How busy were you guys? Very busy. Very busy. How, like how many licks a day? Fuck, dude. It was nonstop. Like, that's why they called. That's why the, they used to was, they call sales back in the day. Licks. Knocks. Because you just hear that knock on the so, door. So we would get so much foot traffic to the point where my dad opened up a candy store in the house to just disguise the foot traffic. Of course. Like, my dad was always thinking of how do I hide what we're doing? Yeah. My dad was never a flashy guy in that sense. Always wear mechanic suits. Blue shirts, mechanic shirts, blue pants, mechanic shirts. And so he built the mixture. He was a welder by trade. So I just took video on my Instagram of the house that's still in Compton. And I asked the girl, hey, is the front made out of metal? She's like, yeah, how do you know? So my dad built that. He literally made a fortress in front of our porch made out of metal. And he created a little small candy store, a neighborhood candy right. store. So it justified the foot traffic coming in mm -hmm. and out of the house, day in and day out. And we would man them. Yeah. We would man the candy store, and we just knew this box was cracked. This was this was this was, for the, <laughs> this was Jolly so, Ranchers. <laughs> yeah, and you as a kid, I remember telling the crackhead, "Okay," and I would yeah. make two lines. Wow, because these kids were taking forever, bro. Wow, so you were really selling candy. You got the candy got busy, and then you had the crack line, which yes, was also busy because that, I knew what they wanted, right? Yeah, on. yeah. Wants to ask me for the prices on the. Oompa Loompas and the, and the <laughs> lawn leaders and the pelones. I'm like, bro, relax. I'm oh, so you guys had Mexican candy. <laughs> oh, of course. If, if yeah. your kid had lead in the 80s, we probably gave it to them. <laughs> we would <laughs> smuggle sure. in. So as as my dad manned the store uh, and we man fucking sold crack for him, um, we had a, I had the business of the candy store. Yeah. So I started, every time we go to Mexico, I would bring back candy from Mexico. Right. And so the pelones came out in the late 80s or yeah late 80s and people know pelones were the, the chili ones that you squeeze and the little chili comes out mm. those were super popular i was selling them like crazy for a quarter and i would bring packs and my dad would see me counting my money and he got wow oh, you're making money on the candy store and now i assume you're not in school of course i'm in school so you go to school go to school i manned the store right after i come back from school it was either a few hours me a few hours my brother yeah we would team off and then when we close shop we would still get people coming up to the house we sold crack we sold mm -hmm. coke so you were selling powder cocaine so, too? yes of course Both. so and at school are you tight-lipped are you telling like your buddies my, my parents had already scared the shit out of us the, if you open your mouth we're all gonna go to jail mm -hmm. you're gonna go to jail we're all gonna be separated you'll never see your brothers you'll never see your mom again. and that's enough like that's enough oh, to for keep a 10 year old the, yeah. I'm, I'm eight year old 10 year old i'm done okay this mm -hmm. i get it this is family secret what a secret to keep at such a young age where kids like kids are notorious for not being able to keep a secret like you tell your buddies everything hey get uh what grade did you get on your report did you, like it's like there, I was an open book back then. I still yeah. am. That's such a heavy thing to keep on. To like that's keep, keep not the, the secret. That's not <clears throat> that secret. It's all the secrets. Mm. See, I'm telling you one situation. I'm telling you when you when you deal with crack cocaine or when you deal with powder cocaine, when you bring just the product of cocaine, the worst in people comes out. Mm -hmm. And as a nine year old, as an eight year old, the things I heard from grown men. Grown women, it makes you lose respect for humanity in, it, in itself. You go, yeah. these are my peers. These are the people I'm supposed to respect. Yeah. And I'm going, shut the f bitch. Shut the f up, bitch. Right. So no. you're this little kid disrespecting these adults, grown people. Adults. Yeah. Because they're hey, so Johnny, desperate. get the f out of that door. I'm going to f you up. 
while hosing them down out of my front yard because they're crackheads that I wouldn't want to sell to, bro. <laughs> Do you understand? You hit the crackhead with the hose? Yeah. Oh. You, you, you're you're a kid as a Damn. acting like an adult, yeah. Yeah. having to manage. You have this power over them. Yes. With this addiction. Exactly. So crazy. There was a gun there. Like we were taught, okay, this is how you pick it up. This is how you're going to clock it. This is what you're going to do. When did they well, tell the, you to use it? It Whenever the f somebody tried to get in, that yeah. is it. As soon as they start banging and they want to get in, use it. My dad never hesitated to grab his 38. So did people try to get in through that metal door? They would bang on the door and say, we sold them potato. So back then, oh, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking crack, about? Right? Fat crack, fake right. Fake crack. Because it's a little yellowish. Yeah, because they, they, make would, it look they like would say, oh, who sold it to you? Hey, that kid from the candy store. So, oh, that motherfucker, you up, bro, that's potato. Or nah, nah, or they'll get cracked from somebody else. They'll go, oh, that's, that. oh, man, this motherfucker gave me potato. Who was it? One of the kids. So they come to me. There was other kids. You understand? Crack vials were everywhere. 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 So what the kids do for a side hustle, why boys would come from Orange County or yeah. people from other cities trying to look for crack or, or coke, yeah. they would get the vials and they would put pieces of potato mm -hmm. inside the vial. And so when the cars came up, they would run up to the window. What you looking for? Crack. All right, here we go. Then we go. Bullshit. It was potatoes, so they had them all. The kids ran away. They just made a quick 40. <laughs> Do you understand? But now they're pissed. And yeah. their excuse is, hey, that kid sold me potato. The only kid they knew was me, and they knew where I lived. Mm. They're like, nah, motherfucker, I don't sell potato. Wow. Did, you, that's, did, you, did your dad ever have to bust at anybody trying to get in? Oh, yeah, dude. We were trying. No, they tried to tax us. Now, the cribs in that area. Yeah, go ahead. No, now, say that again. Who? They tried to tax us. The cribs. The cribs. Remember. We become so much so popular that now the Crips notice yeah. we know you're slanging. Because they had their own crack spots. They have their crack spots, and now their crack hits are not going to them now. They know where who's, who's slanging in that Why? Area. Is it because you guys had better product? That and, and maybe that. I don't know what the reason mm -hmm. was, but we were popular. Yeah. We were, everybody knew. Everybody like in the, in the neighborhood knew that they're slanging. They're was slanging, your, they're was slanging. your neighborhood, was your particular part of Compton mostly Latino or mostly black? It was a good mix uh -huh. of both. And how many crack spots were on that your particular street i have no idea remember i'm i'm yeah, not i'm not knocking a, on doors so saying hey yeah do you sell crack i'm mm -hmm. not my dad my dad probably could answer that question mm -hmm. my job was to stay in the house sell the crack and man that yeah man the store right uh but the things that happened in the, in that moment is i did notice when they came and tried to tax my dad cribs came and said hey bro our neighborhood you could keep slanging but we're gonna start taxing you yeah my dad said F you Mm. thinking hey i got the backup from the biker gang right. this, this and that yeah i got this shit right. this guy he's not gonna tell me what to do blah, right. blah, blah. so the guy just nails my dad boom and drops him he's a big black guy yeah and my dad runs inside the house and grabs his 38 from inside the house bah, bah. he shoots out from the front door the guy looks at him Bales goes to the next apartment building. There's an apartment building right next to our house. Runs up the stairs. My dad, as soon as he comes out, he just goes, pop, 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 pop. He shoots right up the stairs on the apartment wow. building. I'm like, dude, these are apartment buildings. Yeah. Like, there's people living yeah. inside of those houses. And he's shooting the guy up. We're like, what the hell? My mom gets home. My dad's mouth is all busted yeah. from the fight. Yeah. And and my mom said, what happened? No, estos hijos de su pinche madre. Me mm -hmm. cobrar. They try to tax me, this and this and that. And my dad was not having it, thinking, oh, I got the backing from the guys. Yeah, you know, I'm going to let yeah. them know what's up. And mm -hmm. At that moment, they were beefing. Oh, the Crips and the No, no, the biker no, the gang. biker gangs. The biker gangs were beefing with who? Mongols and Angels were beefing at this oh, time. Oh, right. And they couldn't afford to get into another fight. Right, of course. So this is this is towards the end of how we ended up getting out of the business when I was 13. Okay. It's, so you, you ran the shop for how long? We ran it for three to four years. Yeah, that's a long time. That's a long time. It, it, in the drug world, that's a long, long time. Especially a hand-to-hand it, -hand crack sale spot. It's thousands it, of transactions. It's, it's thousands of transactions. But I think more than anything, everybody was making money, and we were in that huge. You know, what I mean, we were we were getting foot traffic, but there was enough for everybody. I think towards the the early nineties, uh, it started getting a little more tight. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we started getting squeezed by the cribs. You mean tight as in less sales? Less or, sales. Yeah. They were bu really buckling down on crack sales. Remember now they were going to get bigger sentences for right, crack sales. Right. All that was going on. So, And you guys never got raided by the cops? 
No, we never got raided wow. by the cops. But what ended up happening was when that happened, that incident happened with the cribs, that's done. We're done, right? It's done. My dad said, they won't come back. If they mm -hmm. do, I'll talk to Ricky. We'll fix mm -hmm. this all right. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Very good. Like a month and a half later, they shoot up the house. Whoa. Okay. What happened? What time of day? This is Are you guys two, in the house? three in the morning, early in, in, in the morning, like two, three in the morning. They shoot up the house. Are you, are you asleep? Oh yeah. Happens? We're in bed. Everybody's in bed. We're just at the house, but they shoot up the house. Like a, a drive by, like they shoot it up. Like they come by, they, they s s s splash spray the house it. where they spray it and they take off. What, and that's probably, is it like a Uzi? Probably, I don't know. All I don't know there was shots. We went to the floor. My mom comes to the bedroom. My dad wakes up. He grabs his gun. We're like, what the f going on? Nobody's outside. My dad's a drive-by. Remember, these were really popular in Compton at this oh, time. Oh, this is like the classic, what we used to associate. I mean, white people from Portland, Oregon knew what a drive-by was. Yes. Like the Crips and the Bloods popularized that yes. back in the day. So they did a drive-by on the house. And my mom freaked out and says, we got to stop, Lolo. This this has to end. Like, one of our kids is going to die. And my dad's like, it wasn't for us. It's a drive-by because we had gangsters that lived on next on mm -hmm. the, next to us and on, on the apartment building. This is probably one of these gangsters that's being shot up. It's not for us. And my mom's like, I don't want this, Lolo. Let's go. Let's go. And, and people, you ask the question, now, your poor mommy that was making the crack, people think that my mom had a choice. See, it's really easy for people to judge my mom and say, where was your mom in all this? Mom next to me, scared. Mm -hmm. You understand? The mm -hmm. monster was my dad. Yeah. My mom didn't read any English or sp yeah. speak any English or wrote or anything. Very little education. Had four kids. No work experience. Where does she go in a country where she has no family members, no yeah. support? Yeah, dependent on your dad. Probably yeah, got married at, at yeah, a young she age. She got married at yeah. 14. Oh, my God. Do you understand what we're talking about here? So for people to judge, so my she, mom say, where was she? Scared <laughs> next to me, trying to hold on and live life. You know what I mean? Like, she didn't have a choice either. Yeah. But at this moment, she understood that if she stood there, she stayed there, we were going to die. My dad convinced her that that wasn't for us. All right. Week later, they stopped. And they just unload. We're about to pack up to go to Mexicali in around 8.30 at oh. night. Brrr, but they this time they stopped. They got off the cars. They shot up the house. And my mom had my little brother, Teddy, on the bed. And as she's putting the bags away to, to leave, we're going on a trip. They start shooting. And she drops to the floor. We all drop to the floor. And they hit my brother's uh, car seat. He flips over. He starts crying. My mom's like Scratching the floor, trying to get to the bedroom, grabs my brother. She opens his trap, gets him out of the child kit, the, the car seat. She gets him naked, trying to find where mm -hmm. the bullet was. And she's freaking out, crying, and it missed them by this much. Oh dude. my God. So your brother missed was sitting it. in a plastic car seat. Yeah, on the bed. That the bullet hit. The hit came through the window, hit the car seat, flipped it over. And my brother was crying because, you know, it's a baby. You flipped it over inside a car seat. My mom gets him butt naked. He's fine. And the, the, the neighbors were like, we saw it. They stopped. They got off. They started shooting straight at your house. That was enough. My mom grabbed black trash bags, started putting everything in black trash cans. Yeah. Telling, we were like 12, 13. Everything bags, Miko, everybody. We were just packing our lives in trash bags. Now, did the cops come when this kind of stuff happens? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, they come later. But they come late. Yeah. Yeah, late. Yeah. I'm talking about 30 minutes later. They yeah. showed up. Like, what's up? What's going on? Two yeah. squad cars. And by this, by this time, my mom had already packed everything. Yeah. We're, we're ready to now, go. Now, do you guys have papers? Are you worried about immigration? Yes. No, my dad, my, my dad would uh, generate these illegal cards or letters. Yeah that stated that you worked here in the early 80s. So uh, immigration, uh, Bush had just approved uh, residency. Or, uh, oh, okay. Remember? The residence <clears throat> card had just come in, or late 80s, early 90s. People were getting a lot of the residence card that you can be a resident here now. Oh, so if you've I worked think, since, you know, the, however the 80s, long. The 80s, the early 80s. Right. So my dad would falsify those letters. Yeah. Oh, and sell them too. And to sell them okay. to illegal immigrants right. in the fields. So that's how he fixed his paperwork. My mom fixed his paperwork. They all fixed their paperwork. So we were born in this country. So we were citizens. Yeah, right. But that's how we were able to travel back and okay. forth in the U.S. Okay. Yep. So she packed everything up. Uh, uh, she had been skimming money off the top. 
every time we made money, she would mm. put it away, put it away, put it away. She had enough money, bunch of cash, goes to a real estate agent, go, here you go. How much cash was it? Like $130,000. Wow, just from skimming. That, well, I'm pretty sure she put more stuff. Because my dad was into everything. Those letters, mm -hmm. they were $3,000 back then. Yeah. Do you understand? And then they would go to the fields in Oxnard and Bakersfield, and there will be a line of people. <laughs> wow. I want a letter. Why? Because that meant you get to stay in this country. That means now you're a resident. Now you become a legal citizen. Wow. Back then, it was just that easy. Yeah, totally. He, so he, he knew a lady in the immigration office that would actually give her the stamps and the seals for those letters. Wow. They were already come stamped and sealed. <sighs> Love that. And, and my mom would just type them up. Yeah. And, and they would just go to the fields. And I remember selling a bunch of those. So my mom kept putting money away saving, putting saving, for years, saving. for years. Cause she knew this is all I have. That was her life savings. Where, where would she keep all that cash? I don't know where the fuck she, kept she didn't it, stash though. it at the house though. I, I don't I know hope. where she kept it. That's a lot of cash, but I don't know how she kept it. Was your it. dad good with money? No, horrible. So he would get he it, blow it? it. Look, if you put a bag, if you put a, a piece of luggage right there with a million dollars, my dad wouldn't even know it was right there. My dad wouldn't know. Like he just went through life. Just, so he would make all this money, but the, I'm he saying burn the, through it. He would just just burn through like, it. On what? Women and bitches, dude. My yeah. mom would literally go to bars and drag his ass out and tell the girl, no, 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 no. Give me his wallet. Now you wow. can keep him. That's old school dude, shit. Dude, my mom, my mom, when I was married with my ex wife and her kid and the other kid, we showed up to Mexicali. My dad's in dialysis on a wheelchair. When we go to the house, we opened up the door, out comes running hookers. Just running out of that Mexican house. <laughs> and my mom's like, Lolo, really? Yeah. Really? You knew we were coming. I called you on the way here. I told you, no creo pendejadas. I don't want them. <laughs> and I get here and I open the door. Hookers are running out like roaches. I have my <laughs> the, the, the daughter-in-law in there with their grandkids and all that. What the Lolo? <laughs> <laughs> that was my dad, bro. God my dad just damn. did not Did care. any of your brothers become like your dad? Somebody yes. must have had to be a chip yes. off the block, right? He disappointed my dad too. <laughs> it's crazy. My dad goes, I can't believe they caught him set making meth. Oh. He's like, come on, man. I dealt with Coke, a gentleman's yeah. drug. God damn it. <laughs> meth is garbage. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I like, oh, there's, there's fucking standards. Yeah, to this come shit. on. <laughs> I'm a classy guy. I sold crack. <laughs> so my, my brother, Leo, he ended up going, he, he just, from day one, it's so weird. He, he just gravitated to that lifestyle. Well, it's not really weird. It's it's, it's kind of predictable. Well, no, because it's it's five of us. It's five of us, mm -hmm. and out of all the five of us, the middle child, <laughs> yeah. Leo, this guy, he just decided, nah, I'm just gonna be a a, a long life criminal. Like I'm gonna yeah. be like my dad. Like he's always he's stealing trailers, making meth, uh. whatever scam, scam he can get into, credit card fraud. Uh, whatever he could get his hands you know. into, that was him. Mm. He was all about it. Yeah. Drug use, all that. There's a saying, uh, a, they ask a guy why he's in prison. They take two people. One of the guys is in prison and they're like, why are you in prison? He's like, well, cause my dad was in prison. And then they go to the other brother. That's what it is. Mm. And they're like, why are you not in prison? He's like, cause my dad was in prison. So it's all, man, it's one out of five kids with a one. upbringing like that. One Falling through the cracks ain't that bad. No. You know, my mom calls it a win. She said, fuck yeah. it. I'll yeah. call it a win. Where is Leo now? Chill. He's locked up. Yeah. He'll, is he, he in the feds? Uh, yeah. For we'll meth? Say. Not for meth, for stealing and fraud and credit card fraud. Mm. They caught him with machines that copy the, the Oh, wow. Cards. So he was, he was in it. He was in it. He was, yeah. he's still doing that. How long is he away for? He's coming out in September. The end of September, he'll be out. Wow. How he old was, is he? He was out. For, he was uh, put away for three years, but it's in and out. I mean, it's, it's yeah. short terms of three years, four years, five years. Like he had four and a half years for making meth. Yeah. Uh, you know, fraud, credit card fraud again. Is he himself a drug addict? I, you know what? I don't speak to him anymore, man. It's just in, in my life, I made it a point to anything that's destructive. Mm -hmm. or are going to somehow jeopardize the happiness that I've created for mm -hmm. myself with my family. I'm going to stay away from it. Oh, wow. And he is just one of those people that just yeah. bad news. Just it's around him. Mm -hmm. Like anytime he is around, the cops are going to show up for some reason. Yeah. It's every time he's around, something was stolen. Every time he's around, it's something got up. That's everybody I mean, in prison. That's everybody yeah. I met when I was locked up.
Yeah, Everybody, I mean, dude. And, 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 and it's funny because he'll boast and say, man, fuck that in there. Everybody respects me. Everybody respects me in there. I mm. get respect in there. I'm like, get respect out here. Mm-hmm. Respect in there. Yeah. That's like me saying, yo, when I go to the open mics, man. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. open mic. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, of course. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you're 13 when the house gets sprayed up where they're aiming, trying mm-hmm. to kill you guys. Uh, this is obviously the Crips you know, from your father, not wanting to pay him. What happens next? Where does your, your mom takes the cash? Where, where, where was the house that she bought? South central LA. Okay. So you guys literally, are upgrading literally <laughs> in San Pedro and 80th. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's, but that's an upgrade from Compton. Oh yeah. It was an upgrade from Compton. Yeah. Even it, back then, even back then, mm-hmm. um, we move out immediately. Like the very next day we spend the night in a hotel that night. The very next day, my mom goes to real estate agents says, I have this much money. Get me a house. You could just take cash like that. Yeah. Back well, then. I mean, I'm pretty sure they found a way. The real estate agent must have done something. With Probably my, Mexican. Too. I just don't know those details because yeah. they didn't confide mm-hmm. me. They don't mm-hmm. say, "Hey, what do you think?" Did they your dad were, go with you guys? No, my dad was opposed to this. He's like, "Don't go. This is what we do. This nope, 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 nope. F- you, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. I'm leaving." My mom at that point had made her. She was confident enough that she had enough money to at least live a year or more without my dad around like she had i mean you understand this mm-hmm. is the the straw that broke the camel's back she mm-hmm. always swore to herself i don't give a f- what happens to me i do care what happens to my kids but right now if if i leave my kids are in trouble like i won't know how to feed them or keep them alive or even give them a roof over their head so she didn't even have, she couldn't have been like a domestic or like yeah raise if my dad kids. didn't drag her ass back home yeah say what the you doing bitch oh uh, so he didn't even let her work no what, why would he let her work uh, i need you in the kitchen cooking bitch, it up you, yes why Man. would you, we make money why would you, where are you going yeah. why do you need to go to work oh that's no good do you understand the situation she found herself so once i that, hope he at least let her clean the house oh no he can clean her own house she can feed <laughs> us she, she can clean all that shit <laughs> i'm kidding yeah she, in fact she better <laughs> she better but she sorts herself if if you guys were ever in true danger like that mm-hmm I would leave and now this is it. Like, I don't think they're going to stop. So we're leaving. And so she packed up our, we left. We got a house right away the very next day, man. Like we were moving in. I was like, to a a new house, not new, but you know, somebody was selling their house. It was a real house. It wasn't a a, real house. It wasn't a makeshift house. Yeah. Like like if you air beat and beat it, bro, back then you Mm -hmm. just walk in. Oh, this is nice. Was it furnished? Yes. Furnished and everything. And we're like, God damn, I don't know what deal they made cash to pay for that. But they took their personal belongings and they came back and they took other stuff. They just said, we're going to put all this stuff in this room and we'll Uh pick it up later. Uh, Not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Just they knew our circumstances. My mom has divulged to him. This is my situation. I have these five kids now. Yeah. And I need a house. Like I need. And so they, the people that they went to, the real estate agent knew them. They spoke to them and they knew my mom's situation. I remember my mom crying in the living room and and the guy said, no, no, tomorrow bring your family here. Mm You have a house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure back then you could do shit like that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, totally. Where does your dad go at this point? He stays at the house selling. Okay. Wow. He's not leaving. He's like, this, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. Two weeks into it, he would come to see us. Yeah. But he would beg us to come back. Nope. And then two weeks into it, my dad just said, it. You know what I mean? I'm coming back. I'm going to quit the business. Uh-huh. I don't know what it was. Maybe he was getting older by this. I know he was already sick. He had diabetes. Okay. So by this, he was getting already sick. So uh-huh. I think he saw that coming. So yeah. he said, F- it, I'm not going to, I can't do this alone. Yeah. If this diabetes gets worse, mm-hmm. I'm going to be completely on my own. Nobody's going to take care of me. So that's when he made the decision. Okay, I'll come back. And Uh-oh. so he gave up the business. He gave up the that. business. Oh, wow. Two weeks okay. after that, he just said, F- it, I'm And did out. your parents stay married? Yes. So he died. So the wow. day he died. And the putas till he died. Putas till he died. Wow. Dude, I'm telling you. He was in dialysis. That's a lifer. Man, that hey, motherfucker. You got to respect. I, dude, I would, Friday nights you do dialysis and I would, I was out of college. I just, I had already started doing comedy and uh, I remember coming home and I'm cleaning my dad's nostrils, doing oh. bumps. I'm like, bro, oh, you just man. did dialysis. And I'm here with, uh, Friday afternoon, just showing up to say hello. I'm like, come on, dad, clean your nose, man. Oh, like, how, what are you doing, dude? You have diabetes, you got dialysis. Yeah. I'm over here cleaning your nose, Pops. Wow. Come on. Did he stay? Did they, your parents stay in that house until he died? No, they, they sold it and then they bought another house on 71st Street, right down, like yeah. maybe 10 blocks down. 
Uh, my dad, by that point, got a job at Hertz Rent a Car. Um, he then they my mom start you know started now manning the household now. Like mm -hmm. my dad kind of took a step back. I think as as he got sick, he realized I can't be that machismo ma macho guy and talk anymore because I'm losing the uh, capability of walking. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to walk my wipe my own ass. I was gotta he be a nice big guy? Was he fat? He was a big fat guy, yeah. dude. Yeah, and so he went down to like. 140, 145 from being 240, 230. Was that hard to see that? Of course. See your dad wither away like yeah, that? Of course. Mm. But but it was like he died at 51. Wow. But he started having kids at 18. Right. And he told it to us. When we were kids, he says, you know why I had kids at such a young age? Because I know I'm going to die young. And my mom said, but yeah, because you keep putting in your yeah. body. Yeah. Like you, you don't drink like a normal person. You yeah. go buy a keg. Wow. And he would just drink, drink a keg? He would a just keg, smash a keg like, to himself? We would go to Mexicali, and he had a pickup truck, so he would put the water, the, the hose, through the back window, have a <laughs> keg in the back with ice, <laughs> and he would just drive and just drink. keep sucking it down. Dude, that's it. He would get, my uncles would tell me stories now. He says, dude, when your dad would come, would, we would have such a great place. He would just get a big rock of Coke. Yeah. And we knew for the next three days we weren't going to sleep and just yes. drink and party yeah. and fuck and yep. do all sorts of yep. shit. We were just down in Mexico. This all sounds accurate. Yes, bro. This like, tracks. People ask me, how'd you get started in your stand-up career? I said, my dad would work at a bar. So my dad started this prostitution ring where he started as a security guard at first. And sounds then, like he got high on his own supply. Oh, he got high on everything. <laughs> but he would be the guard at the at these Mexican bars. Okay. And and one day they called him from Los Cuatros. Los Cuartos. Los Cuartos is in East LA. It's a place where all these illegal immigrants come and live there seasonally. And it's like 30 to a, a room. Oh, but it's le legal though. They're, they have like migrant paperwork. No, they're, oh, they're so all illegal. They're, all illegals. they're okay. all illegals. And it's just like the slums, right? Yes. Like, like it would be a place like this and everybody's sleeping here and they go to work the fields. Yeah. And they sleep there or they'll do these, the seasonal work. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they would go to the Chalino bars, these Mexican bars where my dad would be the security guard. So they called in and said, a la Susana, aquí a los cuartos. Meaning, can you bring, bring us Susana. the girl, Susana, the girl that works the yeah. bar, bring her to us. Oh, it's a Friday this night. Poor girl, it's gonna be a long day. Oh no, you, she Deal was excited. <laughs> she was excited because she was gonna about to break the bank. Yeah. <laughs> so she goes. They take us. My dad gives her a ride to to the cuartos, and she gives him a twenty, and they give him a twenty. He just made forty bucks. He says, I made more money in one drive. Yeah. Than what I would have made working the entire night as a security guard there. Mm -hmm. So what he did. And he, it's not crack. You're not gonna. Nobody shooting me up. Nothing. Yeah. So he grabs one of those brown UPS trucks. Mm -hmm. Back then it was the Quaker bread trucks. Yeah, I remember them. So he put bench seats on each side and he went to every Mexican bar picking up these ficheras, the girls that worked there, at the end of their shifts. And he would take them to, to los the cuartos, cuartos and charge 20 bucks per girl for every girl he brought in. And then they would tip him 20 bucks. So he was walking away with maybe $200, $300. Just wow. transporting working, hookers working from the weekend. bars after yeah. they were done working to the cuartos. Wow. And, and is that still a practice? In I Mexican don't know. Culture? I, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure prostitution happens right now. What they have son las, las cariñosas or they call it las sinvergüenzadas, meaning the, I know this happens. These bars will contract on a Tuesday or Wednesday night. The girls from Tijuana. Yeah. Put them in a van, drive them all the way over here. And for a dollar, you're at a bar <laughs> and you have them dance on you yeah. and nasty happens yeah, it's yeah. a crazy orgy of the tijuana hookers yeah. and, and they call it dollar dances wow all you need is a dollar still, in the girl, the, still? Yeah, still they keep the market down Bro, that's why talk to me off pod <laughs> so yeah my dad started wow. so my he started a business bro. essentially like um a transportation and a security business for hookers yeah so he had a gun and they knew he was a security guard and, so. and he had the the clients too yes, yeah of those, course. Uh, the, the migrant worker those migrant workers, workers. Man, that's got to be poor Sus. I mean, Susanna's a soldier. Dude, that She's night. Guys that smell like though. radishes and onions. Susanna and told my dad, <laughs> Lolo, no importa, se lava de todos modos. All you have to do is yeah, wash exactly. it. It doesn't lose it. <laughs> just to wash it. We're good. <laughs> oh, my God. That's wild. So, How long did he do that for? Uh, till he got shot. Okay. Okay. So he got shot. I keep thinking the story's going to end. <laughs> no. And it just I'm never ends with your papa. Oh, no, no, no. It ended when he died. Yeah. But <laughs> He gets shot for talking shit. The guy wanted to drag the girl out. And he's like, no, no, se va ir conmigo. She's leaving with me. And the guy, the drunk guy from Zacateca, I was like, no, you, she's leaving with me. But my dad knew. This, this was a trick? 
No, so no. Like, this was a John? This no, was a guy who was buying. This is a guy in the bar having a good time with Susana, but yeah. it wasn't Susana, it was another girl. Yeah. So they're having a good time, right? And as and when you go to these bars, get her a beer too. Her beer costs twice as much mm -hmm. because she's staying with me and we're talking. She's she's chilling with me. The moment I stop buying drinks, she leaves. So all night long, this guy's been talking to her and buying her drinks. Well, it's two o'clock. My dad's going to take these girls. You know, yeah. we got, we got, yeah, we got real money to be, to be made. made. Yeah. yeah. And this girl's ready to go too. And the guy now, it's two o'clock in the morning. We're closing down the bar. He goes, she's coming home with me. She goes, no, no, no. I'm going with him. He's going to take me home. No, I've been paying all night. You're going to come home with me. And he's like, no. And they get into a fight and he beats the out of my dad Ooh. he beats the fuck <laughs> out of my dad i mean that guy was wearing pointy boots with the metal in the front oh. he said i can feel the copper up here oh, dude like no. he kicked me right in the ass with those uh, boots way worse than the crib he, he said he's beating the out of me this guy is tall and finally i said let's go outside and he was bent there and he goes outside and as soon as he goes outside my dad closes the door you and locks it oh, and wait. won't open it and won't open it. And the guy, the owner of the bar yeah. says, open the door. He's like, you, we're not opening that door. That guy's going to kill me. <laughs> guy goes to the car, starts shooting at the door, shot my dad in the leg. Oh. And that was it. After he did the shots, he took off. Uh, my dad went to the hospital. They patched him up. But that, did that put him out of business? Uh, uh, yeah, because he, he was out of a commission. Yeah. Uh, these guys started picking up their own girls now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they started jumping. Yeah, yeah. So my dad said, you know what? I don't need to deal with this anymore. Let me Your go dad kind of was like the guy that couldn't shoot straight. He was the guy. He was always bringing trouble. Great he was, just, he was hapless. Yeah. A little bit. Like unlucky, you know? Unlucky. Of it, his own making, though. And not because of lack of opportunities. Like the guy had so many great opportunities. Just He just didn't know how to really maximize those opportunities. Right. I said, Mom, what happened to all that money we made? Yeah. He said, your dad spent it. Yeah, yeah. All that money? He says, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he blew. Like, he would hire the mariachi and say, okay, I want you to go to the women's bathroom. Start playing the trumpet from over there. <laughs> okay, mariachi, go. And he would have them there for hours. Yeah. And the guy would have to come out with the trumpet, and the, he would just have a blast. I was yeah. like, God damn it. Yeah, he really lived for the moment. So and we got to witness all this. So, and he died young. He went back to Mexico to die? No, he went to Yuma, Arizona. He had bought property there. Uh -huh. He had prop property in L.A. He had property in Mexico. He 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 made a pretty good nest for himself. But oh, so he did at least buy that. Yes, at least he invested in property. So the moment he decided, I'm leaving L.A. I'm going to retire. I, I need. I'm just going to go die somewhere. He went to Yuma, Arizona. Mm. The very next day, he died. Wow. The day he said, I'm leaving LA, I'm done with this. I'm, uh, dialysis, he had already set up everything in Yuma, Arizona. I hope and, he had one final putita. Uh, probably my mom, because oh. <laughs> I was the only one that was there. But so, And she, your mom, stayed down the whole time. Different breed, bro. This a is different, different breed, breed, a different time. A God-fearing woman. You probably had a Rosario hanging up somewhere in your house. Yeah. But look, it stopped... All that praying stopped a bullet from killing her little baby. That is true. There's something to it, man. <laughs> There's something to it. So uh, how old is your mom now? She's in her 60s. She's like 67. And is she doing well? Oh, she yeah. Healthy? Yeah. She Look, my mom, when my dad died at 51, she was like 48, mm -hmm. 49 when he died. Already she, a grandma, I'm sure. Already a grandmother. <laughs> uh and at, at 62, 63, she gets a boyfriend. Yeah. And I'm like, it's on, mom. Why are you on? Like, mija, like, I told her, mom, you, you do not, because she wanted to talk to us about it. I said, no, no, no. He met him at church. I said, yeah. mom, you on. Yeah. Like, you, totally. you earned it. Yeah, like, um, you, you, you did yeah. it right. You, you waited. Your husband died. Then 10 years later, you decide, I'm going to go find somebody else. That's it. You mourn Nobody for a decade. is here to tell you or yeah. judge you in any way, shape, yeah. or form. Go yeah. Latin but, Latin women, I notice that even when I'm in Spain, but like definitely all over South America, older Latin women have boyfriends because yes. they've gotten married too young. They've been through some version of what your mom went through with yeah. an ex-husband, cheated on, had her kids, divorced, and now it's like, I'm going to go live. So you'll see 78-year-old women with boyfriends out yeah. on a Friday night having a beer at midnight. Yeah, you know? She never experienced that. Wow. She That's was great. always a mother all her life. That's great. Okay. So what did she do for a living 
I guess after your dad died, Nothing. she's only 48. How does she survive? Dude, my dad had a pension through Hertz, uh, through the Teamsters, uh, properties. Mm -hmm. And my dad had money in the bank. Like literally my dad, before he passed away, he said, here's 10 grand for you. Here's 10 grand for you. Everybody got 10 grand. Don't bother your mother. Oh, so he didn't do that bad. No, 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 no. Yeah, but were... it was, it was, do you understand the chaos had to stop? Yeah. Meaning you can't have hookers every day. You can have mariachis playing for right, you every day. Right. Like, well, no, but you were on your dad calling him a monster. And, and you know, certainly you're, you have the right to those uh -huh. feelings, but I mean, he didn't die penniless. He bought property. He sounds like he set your mom up a little bit. Okay. But you, you can't give him credit when you already are sick. I mean, you, you, mm -hmm. if he could, though, he would be a monster the entire time. Mm -hmm. You stop being a monster because you're vulnerable now. Mm -hmm. you, you, it's not, you're not, you, you didn't say, I don't want hookers. You said, I cannot have hookers. <laughs> you understand? It's like a, well, you can not, hang out with them still. Yeah. They can come around. They can wash you. Yeah, but he, that, that, those weren't his options anymore. So yeah. when, when you tell me you've changed, no, your circumstances changed. Yeah. And that's why you adapted to survive. Yeah. So what he did was listen to my mom now. And keep in mind, too, at this time, we're older, too. So we're also guiding my mom. They have a big support now. My my brother is now teaching them, okay, this is how you save money. So it's not that my dad wasn't a hard worker. He hustled. Yeah. But it was after the mayhem. After yeah. he was a monster, yeah. he decided, okay, now I need to calm down and mm -hmm. settle down and make money. What do your other siblings do besides Leo? Uh, you know what my, he does. My brother... Works for uh, BuzzFeed. Okay. He's a producer at BuzzFeed. Oh, wow. Uh, that's my younger brother, the one that almost died. How, uh, oh, the one that yeah, got that was in, in, the, the, in, the, the, in the baby chair. Baby yeah, the chair. high chair. Oh, wow. He ended up, he's working for BuzzFeed. My other brother owns his own uh, construction company. He has uh, glass and glazing storefronts and all that stuff. The older brother. Yeah. The other brother opened up a restaurant in Texas. He mans that. And then I do stand up. Yeah. This Killing shit. it. And then my other brother's in jail. Yeah, but man, that's I'll take that. Oh, yeah. that's a lineup, dude. All of them went to college except the one that, yeah. that went to jail. Wow, everybody, you guys are like thriving. I mean, yeah. that's the the immigrant. I envy the immigrant struggle a little bit because everybody, there's no excuse. When you come from a place like Jamaica or Mexico or even worse, you know, Haiti, we talk to all these people on the show, these kids of immigrants, and it's like there's no excuse. You come into America where money grows on trees, go make something of yourself. Yeah. And th that mentality works, you know, and now it's your kids that are going to be soft like me. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what people were asking me. So how did you survive all that? Because you were in the midst, midst of all this. You, mm -hmm. you were involved. You got to see it as a kid. You were dealing with drug dealers. You, you, they were in your house. You guys hung out with them. Were there any discussions? I mean, we can go millions on, on stories on millions. Yeah. Of but I said, what that gave me was grit. Does that make sense? Yeah, Meaning when you have to kick a grown man out of your front yard with a water hose <laughs> and you have that kind of power. Like a dog. Like, do you like think, a rabid, like a goat. So do you, Like a Compton Street goat. <laughs> exactly. So you think you're going to face me? Yeah. I dealt with crackheads. Mm -hmm. So you're a teacher who wants to give me a beat? Man, f*** you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You're so pickled in that mm -hmm. anger, in that mm -hmm defense mode that you're like nah dude you you don't cave in easily now you create a grid in me and so you survive and i think that's what we thrived on as as brothers it was such a harsh place that we came from that it was so hard for you guys to break us or mm -hmm. in society to break us mm. we can overcome a lot of things and you're right how do i teach that to my daughter yeah how do i do i start selling crack yeah to make well, her a better person. <laughs> no, there's got to be a way to. There's got to be a way. Maybe you tell stories. Maybe you tell her these stories, and you don't. You don't give her everything she asked for, and you let her know. Just a reminder of how hard it can be. That's probably enough. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. Like my uncle lived in the bus that my dad negotiated, the school bus in the back. Okay. Oh, tell us about so, this. So. so because he was there. He so you had a American. school bus in the back of your yeah. house in Compton? A huge school bus. Because these were back <laughs> big backyards in Compton. And so he lived there. And I remember one day they were smoking crack. Because it's, it's a very unique smell of crack. Yeah, crack it's like smell. a sweet, yeah. kind of sweet smell. I, I, yeah, like, I don't know. How to you could tell. Yeah. That's crack. 
And so who's smoking your uncle, my uncle and another guy in there that were smoking crack. Okay. And my aunt was an addict also. Ah, so my aunts oh, outside, open the door, open the door. And I am playing outside, but you hear in the background that open the door and you could tell, fuck, fuck. And all of a sudden I hear it and I'm, I'm 12. And you know, you're, you get curious at 12, you're becoming a man and boobs and girls are now mm-hmm. nice and, and all that. Is yeah. And plus right? you got crack money now in oh, your pocket. Whoa, we'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> So I hear, we'll go open the door. I was like, I'll suck your d- if you open the door. I was like, man, is that how I can get my dick suck? I got crack. I'm going to get my dick suck. I'm going to get a rock, bro. Like, hold on, hold on. So your aunt was trying, was offering to suck your d- Oh, not my, my uncle's. D- he's oh. in the bus. They're smoking crack. I'm outside playing. But I overhear. Your aunt and uncle. Brother and sister? No, no, no. Oh, my okay. aunt and uncle, they're 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 married. They're oh, crackhead oh, couple. Oh, gotcha, I'm sorry, they're gotcha. crackhead couple. Okay, got gotcha, Except my okay, uncle's okay. being greedy and smoking it with his friend in the bus. <laughs> and my aunt wants to hit that pipe. So <laughs> in the bus doors. And, and, and so as soon as she says, if you open the door, I'll suck your <laughs> I was like, oh shit, is using that? the driver's <laughs> seat like so I was at the door open, and then my aunt went in. I'm pretty sure she sucked somebody's dick. Yeah, yeah. And they smoked crack, dude. And I was like, damn. Like, as a kid, your your thought goes very distorted. You yeah. go, oh, so that's how I talk to women. I give them crack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, no, that's not how you talk to that's women. How they te- that's what they teach them at couples counseling. <laughs> yeah. uh, she don't want to suck your dick, just give her yeah, crack. give her this crack. Yeah, yeah she'll, she'll get addicted. Wow. <laughs> Imagine that. Did you ever have to go to therapy for any of this? Have you yeah. explored it? You have. So, I talked to my therapist. He said, what you live was childhood trauma. Yeah. Meaning it, PTSD. Yeah. It, you're, he says, you lose control. Is We had a whole discussion. He says, what was the most horrible moment in your life that you, that you can describe? I said, okay, don't tell me anything. Just go there. And then he said, what did you feel at that moment? And then start describing well i felt you you know helpless i wanted to help my mom this was going on i says okay do you understand that now as an adult when you're with your wife and your kid and things don't go well and you feel like your family in some way shape or form in danger or going to be discomfort or anything you freak the f- out do you feel like you lose control and you're just out of control yes okay that stems from that trauma that you suffered as a three-year-old living in Watts mm-hmm. that that moment in your life has you acting this way because you don't want to feel, feel helpless anymore. Yeah. So the way they, they want to take care of it now is a method where they go and they move your eyes from side to side. And they said that that trauma, that PTSD you have little by little, you'll start minimizing the importance of it. And you can actually change in three to four sessions, the trauma that you lived and they, it, by it just physically just moving your eyes, like moving that. your eyes like wow. this. And, 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 and they have you think about that same situation that you mm-hmm. found yourself in. Now let's repeat that again. Okay. What did you feel? Okay. Now let's, let's, let's explain what's going on. So you talk to them while you're moving your eyes and you're thinking of that moment in your life and keep moving your eyes, keep moving your eyes. And somehow your brain will rewrite yeah. that. Oh, it's like hypnotism. That's a way it's, it sounds yes. a little bit like hypnotism, hypnotism, but it's a new method that a lot of therapists are now using oh, to, wow. to cure. I got to get PTSD. some of that, man. Definitely. So I'm going to do a live session yeah, and I'm going to discuss that moment with my dad and my mom in Compton and yeah. his wife, other yeah. wife yeah. and the other kid and the gun. And oh, everything. what was it? What, so your dad had another wife? Oh, of course. Oh, when let's you have that about- much money, you can have another wife. Yeah. I have a brother my age. Oh my God. <laughs> I have you, brother my age. When did you guys meet? Uh, when I was three, that, that day in, Com- uh, in, in Watts. That's the trauma, the day of trauma. My yeah. dad basically had, had this thing. He went on this Coke like bench. Mm-hmm. And so he brought his other wife to the house and he sat my mom down. He sat her down. Who was well, hotter? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to answer that. I don't know at that time, but I saw them. Oh, they're both f- up. At- <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, you know what? That's what I have <laughs> yeah. to tell myself. I'm like, Mitchell, you don't have to cheat. They all end up looking the same. They do. Yeah. They do. So, <laughs> but I know he had his gun in his hand and he was pointing at them and then asking, okay, we're all going to live together. That's the arrangement. Oh, <sighs> 
And my mom, first time she meets this lady, I said, that's my wife. You're my wife too. Everyone, everybody lived together. And my mom's like, I'm leaving. No, you're not, bitch. Wow. And it just becomes beat down after beat down, both of them. Oh, and man. then he gives me the gun, says, now you, you shoot me then. And so he gets on it. Like, so it's the whole me holding a gun to my dad's head. Like at three years old, of course, a loaded gun, a loaded, like three or four. I know I was in like kinder at the time or preschool, wow. a loaded gun. Well, I'm pretty sure he didn't have an empty gun. Yeah. So pistol whipping them, all that, like just living that moment. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's so, awful. It's awful. Says, let's, let's work on that. Moment. Did, did he keep the wife the whole time? Yes. Like, did he kept he the still, second wife? Yes. Yes. And, and do you have any contact with her today no. or your half brother? No, I, the last thing I know is that she passed away. My half brother became a doctor, went to UCLA. Wow. Never have contact with him after the age of 13, 14. And, and why is that? Is that just because it's awkward or like you just don't care? They're strangers to you? Does uh, it? One, it's, it's, I know who my dad was. So mm -hmm. if he was bad to us, he was really bad to them. Yeah. So I know he never wanted to talk to him after the age of 13. My dad had told me like, that son doesn't want to see me. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure for, he has his yeah, reasons. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, and so they lost contact. My dad and him lost contact. They never spoke again. Um, my but young, he stayed married to that woman while he was married to your mom? He was never married to that other woman. Okay, gotcha. It was just a side piece. I got right. pregnant and he decided, okay, yeah. I have two households. Okay, yeah. So for a long time, he ran two households. He would, wow. he would get tired of being at the house. He would go to his other house. No wonder he died at 50 because he's like, I just can't take it. Bro, it's enough. He lived two lives. Yeah. In one. So. Yeah. I think that was really common back then. Oh, yeah. Mexican yeah, yeah, yeah. men. A little guman on the side. Come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right now in. all men, but like yeah. especially, you know, Mexican La guys. Yeah, land guys. Yeah. It was just part of, it's part of the budget. It was, it was weird because in Mexico, they'll set it up that way. They'll go, this is for the rent, this is for the food, this is for the bills, this is for the hookers. Yeah. And then this is where. It's, it's on the balance sheet. The it hookers is, are is, on the balance sheet. It is sheet. included in there. Wow. Una nalguita. Ahí está. This is for Saturday's little adventure. And the, and the women go along with that because. It's so normalized or why, they feel like they don't have a choice. Why do the Italian women accept the gumaras? Yeah. They don't accept them. Nobody said that they're okay with it. They just don't have any choice. Yeah. Because they, they have no, they have no way to survive outside their husband. That, and, and I think it, it was just a cultural thing. Like he cheats on you too, right? He cheats on me too. Mm. He cheats on you. Well, well we, cheat, we all get husbands. We all get cheated, cheated on. on. Yeah, it happens. We all get taxed. The man taxes you. I yeah, get taxed. Yeah, we can all yeah. kind of forgive it because we're all in it together. Yeah. yeah, and we all look, the, that's the way the guys are. That's just men. That's what they would say. With now women working mm -hmm. in the workforce and talking about marriage counseling is, since then, divorce rate goes up. Yeah. Why? I, I'm not dependent on you anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to wait here and let you cheat on me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be independent. So that's what happens. Now, yeah. now Latin, I don't think that's Latino culture anymore. I think now... Uh, it's changed maybe in the small towns or uh, rural areas or uh, small little villages, they still practice something like this. But in the main cities where the wife works, the husband works, there's no way your wife's going to go, wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to hide it now. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, do you go back to Mexico a lot? I did for a long time before I got canceled. <laughs> oh, which we're going to talk about on the Patreon, patreon.com slash the connect show. Yes. We're going to switch over to that. Now I want to hear about your comedy journey. This yeah. is going to be a fun one. Go over to the Patreon because like Richard, I remember seeing you when I first started comedy because my friend, Brian day, who's Brian Torres day now, Torres because day, you know, yeah. when diversity came into Hollywood, he had to throw that Torres back on it. Yeah. Uh, he, we, we saw you at the improv and you were doing comedy in Spanish oh, you were killing. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's cool. You know, that's yeah, yeah. uh this is going to be a market, yes. a big market. So I want to talk about like that. And then I want to talk about how you get, got canceled. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I didn't even know you could cancel a Mexican guy. I thought yeah. there was a whole Oh, bro. Bar. I had death threats. I that's had death wild, threats bro. for some. That's you really got to listen to yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I want to hear about that. I, I talked to Tom Segura about it. He was upset at the comic that banned me and started blacklisting. Oh, Tom Segura can you name names on the Patreon? Yeah, yeah, okay, of course. Okay, I'll drop dope. all the names on the yeah, Patreon. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you the whole story. Damn, and, that's foul, and bro. And Tagura was like, dude, I'll never talk to that guy again. Are you serious? That yeah. guy, oh, what I bet he's not it. even a good comic. That's he, that. No, the, this is the thing. The guy is an amazing guy. He's the Kevin Hart of Mexico. I got banned. It was 8.9 million people watching during the pandemic in 2020. No way. It was 8,000. Is he a 8, Mexican? 8, 8 million 
eight point some million subscribers. He's the Kevin Hart of Mexico, of Latin America. He's one of the biggest comedians. If not, no, he wow. is the biggest comedian. Is, is he actual? A, is he a Mexican comedian? He's a Mexican or a comedian. Mexican -American? No, he's from Monterrey, Mexico. Oh Mexico. wow! Oh wow! The guy. Look, I understand why he threw me under the bus because at that time we were everything was so uncertain, and all he had was this. 8.9 million people to make a living. And and my roast put him in a very bad light because okay. Mexico turned on him too. Like yeah. how, how would yeah. you allow him to say that on ha, the air? Ha, 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 ha. So we'll talk about that. Oh, in this the is fascinating. Okay. Yeah. But I want to hear all about that. This is uh, one of the most unique stories I've ever heard. What do you feel like the best thing about your childhood was now as a grown man who can look back? People say that what my dad did was child abuse. And I tell people, those were the best years of my life. No, get out of here. I'm not, look, I'm not defending that the that I went through was okay to, for a kid to go through. But what I did get that I noticed that none of my friends got was a father, a dad. Regardless, he was present. Regardless, we talked every day. Mm -hmm. He was proud of me. I helped. I felt useful. There was a sort of pride that came with being part of something that big. Yeah. Where you knew that everybody worked as a team to to contribute to the family. And it showed unity. My dad would open up the refrigerator and say, what do you see? I said, a six pack of beer. He said, no, 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 no. Behind the six pack of beer, a gallon of milk. And he would teach these little classes of first take care of your family. Then you get, get your drink. Right. I'll tell you this. My dad was a drug addict. My dad was a drunk. My dad was a womanizer, a masochist. A racist he was everything but he also never let us go hungry ever yeah well, he obviously. never let us live in an apartment yeah because i don't want anybody telling my kids what they can do and mm. i'm the only person that can, can do that mm. so there was a sense of pride that he taught me mm. as a man mm. that i think a lot of people lack i got to tell my dad as an adult why were you such an asshole like why did you put your foot on my neck all my life and not let me breathe and he said, because I was going to lose you to the streets. Wow. And if, and I made peace with, with what you're asking me right now, I'm, I had that conversation with myself years ago. And I said, I am limited to the, how I can raise my kids. I can only raise them with force. But I know if I let go of this foot, the streets will get them. They're going to eat them. He says, you sold crack in that room. You know why? Because I would rather you sell crack there where I can see you. I would rather have you sell crack where you were with me. Yes, it wasn't right, but I was always there to take care of mm. you. I was always alert. Mm. So if you hate me now because I had my foot on your neck all your life, then I was willing to take that hate so and I was it. okay with it. So be it mm -hmm. because I know that this is as much as I could do with what I knew. Survival. And I was like, all right. It. Wow. <laughs> I'll take it. Wow. So, so you actually talked about it before you got a chance before to, he died. You got a chance to reconcile. Did you, was that some closure? You oh, like definitely. Closure? Because I'm not saying it justified his actions, but at the end of the day, the fact that he even put thought behind it and he did it on purpose. He said, I spent this time with you guys talking to you guys all this time that we would chat chat and joke around. He says, I did that on purpose. I understood what that meant mm -hmm. for you to mm -hmm. have a father, to have a father figure, a man figure. Somebody to tell you, this is a man. This is not a man. This <laughs> is what you do. This is what not to do. You wouldn't he do well <laughs> in this new trans world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about old school teaching. Yeah, yeah, Back yeah. then, my dad's like, cogete las a todas. My dad would tell me advice like, fuck them all, go fuck them all. But that was like, that was, he really thought he was teaching you a lesson. Like, yes. I see it's como se Yeah, exactly. So, I, I, Best moments of my life, man. And the fact that you never got caught, the fact you guys never got raided with that. My dad never got like, caught. That's pretty wild. I got busted. You did get busted selling I dope. Got, I got, no, no, no. How does every drug dealer get busted? Every uh, got that. Oh, no, no, no. Money. Right. But what is he doing with his money? No, he's being flashy. When you are being flashy with your, my dad, remember, wore mechanics, pants, mechanic shirt, had a, 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 auto shop next to the house like mm -hmm. very low key mm -hmm. nobody flashed anybody we drove an old regal like mm -hmm. nobody was showing anybody yeah. money but i'm making money and i'm a kid and i want friends in school so i start going to the candy store at the elementary school and i told the kids who wants candy and i have 300 bucks in my hand why the f 
does a yeah. three year old in 1988 have $300 and yeah. told all the kids, candy's on me? Wow. You know what that does against? Ah, yeah, of course. Mayhem. So a teacher comes over and says, What the f is going on? He's going to buy us candy. Who? Richard. The, she goes to me and I have the wad of cash because these are ones. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it looks huge. She's like, come here. Where did you get that? I was like, it's my money. I have a store. I have a business. I said, bullshit. They call my dad up. They said, hey, we caught your kid with 300 bucks. My dad thought I was snitching. My dad thought, fuck, they got us. They found Richard with 300 bucks. Like, how do we explain that? When he came to pick it up, the lady said, I know it's your money. I know he probably took it from you. And it was, we wanted you to come because want to hand it to you. Mm. It's a lot of money for your son to be carrying mm. around. He must have took it from your wallet. Uh, My dad's like, oh, okay. Oh, I'm wow. like, bro, he did the sign of the cross. I'm like, that's coke money, bro. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, <laughs> But damn. I got busted that's for sure. No. That's, yeah, but you never got raided, though, by the cops. Never got raided. And the, I mean, the odds raided. of that, you know, especially moving into the 90s, you know, you had a pretty good run. We had a really that good a run. run. And, and it's surprising. I don't know why we never got busted. Maybe because my dad always kept it low key, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe there was just other fi bigger fish to fry. I'll other be fiends. honest with you. I, I yeah. think they they. We, I, I'm pretty sure we were under surveillance. I'm pretty sure the cops knew we were selling. Yeah, yeah, but you 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 know, like you only sold it to people using it. So yeah. you know, that's kind of what I we talked about on the show. When you just sell it to people that are smoking it up, they got nothing to get busted with. So then they can't turn around and rat you out. So yeah. maybe that that's what helped you know and what I, I mean? think you're absolutely right that's what i'm saying we're so low-key we're yeah. so little in, yeah. in terms of scheme of yeah. things like give us somebody that's moving big kilos yeah well there's this guy that sells that corner guy right. i'm talking about right. the big boys <laughs> you know what i mean but that's how much crack money there was back then that a little nickel and dime candy the spot for could four still years. make but still make hundreds of thousands of dollars i mean yes. your mom had 130 just from stealing yeah, you know? yeah. So, like there was a lot of Dude, people smoking crack back in those days. My, but but that's that's what I'm saying. It's I think that's what it was for us back then. It was so much of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you, to the point where kids were selling potato. Yeah, and people were buying it. I mean, I mean, how do you just get away with selling potato? It's an Amer <laughs> It was an American phenomena that I don't think will ever happen again. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. it was. It was like a uh, that f you know, ten years of like this thing that nobody could explain like white boys coming from oc to the hood like it's See, we wild we should have got like like okay what do you call it toll roads heading to the hood yeah to yeah. charge orange county just like they charge us when we go to irvine yeah, right Fuck you i'm gonna charge <laughs> you to come get cracked yeah. 50 cents every yeah. time you come <laughs> yeah yeah right yeah, damn um, richard via where can they find you my man at richardvia.com uh, or uh, www.atrichardvia.com or at Richard Comedy. All my platforms at Richard Comedy. Um, Very and, funny stand-up comedian. Yes. Uh, go, he's everywhere. He's he's all over the country. You're moving tickets. Yes. I'm telling you, if you like stand-up comedy, especially if you're Latino, but mm -hmm. if everybody, go see this guy. Go follow him. Do you have a podcast? Yes, I have a podcast called the Richard Via Podcast, and we're going to change it to a marriage counseling with Richard Via, just because me and this marriage counselor hit it off. Yeah, and he's we're we're trying to navigate through with marriage in Latino world in America. If you're trying to figure out how to get your <laughs> wife to suck your crack, listen crack. to Richard's <laughs> podcast. All right, and go check out the Patreon that we're going to do right after this. Patreon.com/slash/the Connect Show. This has been the Connect. We'll see you guys next week. He's out.